All right. So uh, I want to take a step back and maybe try to focus on you as of now, apart from being a research scientist at Google Brain. So I want to focus on uh, Natasha Jakes and trying to learn more about what really intrigued you to pursue a PhD. Uh, what was the reason that you thought that, hey, I want to I wanna give up five years of my life and put <laughs> myself into a position where I won't have any other life. Why did you, what really intrigued you for uh, doing a PhD? <laughs> I don't think the answer is going to be so great, but I think it was basically <laughs> like, so I was in undergrad and I didn't really, you know, it's sort of a random walk over opportunities is really what it was. When I was in undergrad, I was really good at school. I liked school. I was always like that annoying, like, I know you too, like <laughs> the student, right? Um, so doing well in undergrad, I got offered like a research internship. So I just did a research internship. I think um, in undergrad, my first thing was on, um, oh, evolutionary strategies to solve Pac-Man and like various other like pseudo machine learning, but like old school techniques. And then just did a few more research internships across different areas. I did more like, um, I've done a lot of like, uh, digital signal processing, like music stuff, weirdly, which I was not as into. And then eventually end up going to a master's degree because that just seemed like the obvious next step. Went to a PhD from there. That was another obvious next step. And so things evolved. Yep. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and uh, how did, how did, uh, uh, how did you decide the thesis of your PhD? Was it something that you, that someone suggested, someone, uh, maybe uh, inspired you to do it or was it something like how how did you how did you pick up your topic that hey this is what I'm really motivated this is something <laughs> that I I, I really want to do and how did you end up deciding or did you have any uh, unsaid uh, other thesis topics that maybe uh, maybe you and advisor only knew but you didn't end up publishing those things that hey this is a scrappy idea <laughs> yes we did so I actually okay so I interviewed for my PhD um, with Roz's group at MIT with the, I, the following idea. I wanted to make an autism prosthetic. So I wanted to have Google Glass look at the images of the person you were talking to, detect their facial expression and display it to you. So it would say, this person seems bored. Maybe you should stop talking right now. Something like this. <laughs> um, and I like I just found this, I thought this was gonna be so cool. It was much more of an HCI project. Um, like, you know, the facial expression recognition was not a key focus of the project. You probably use a pre-existing tool. Um, by the time I joined the lab, that was in March or something. By the time I'd actually joined Roz's lab in September, someone else had done that project. Um, I think he actually started a, started a company out of it. So he was at Stanford. I forget his name. I'm sorry. Um, but so that exists, the autism prosthetic Google Glass thing. Although I guess now that Google Glass doesn't exist anymore, I don't know what happened. But that was the, that was the idea. <laughs> Had to pivot, um, took machine learning uh, my first semester. And I think, you know what it was? Okay, I was originally doing much more like, okay, I'll tell you the whole story. I'm getting excited about this now. Yeah, so I, I did a, an undergrad in both computer science and psychology. And I was pretty, you know, psychology was having sort of a replication crisis um, where studies weren't replicating. And a lot of what I learned in my undergrad was like stuff Freud said which is to me like not good science. It's like closer to philosophy. I could argue about this, people will be mad, but um, like it's not, it wasn't rigorous, right? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, like, I, I still wanna argue, but yeah, definitely for another podcast, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, but it's or like, okay, I, we did a lot of like reading Piaget's work, which is actually valid, but it was a lot of studies he conducted on his own three kids, right? And so it's just like, this is not data driven. Like what is the going on here? So I had this dream of like, I want to use machine learning to understand like psychological questions and like use machine learning as the next set of statistical tools. Like psychology already uses a lot of statistics to use machine learning to get better answers. So that's sort of where I started. But what happened is I went to my first NeurIPS in 2015 and I just fell in love with it because I was like, oh my God, we're living in the future. Look at how cool this is. AI is real. This is happening. Like I was so excited. I remember some of the papers I saw, this was Neurox like 2015. There was a humanoid robot that had learned to climb up on surfaces by like putting its hand on the surface and pushing itself up and then like putting its leg up and climbing up purely end to end with like no prior. 
And that was just like the most efficient way to get a human body onto a ledge. And I was like, this is so cool. There was um, end-to-end -end memory networks, which were like, looked like it was doing like analogies and reasoning, which it isn't, but I was excited. And like, just, you know, the, a bunch of results where I'm like, oh my God, like AI is so good. Things are really happening. And then I just, I switched. I really moved away from what my advisor works on during my PhD. Um, so that was uh, somewhat challenging. By the time I was like writing up my thesis, which I think is your question, you know, it was, things had changed significantly. And so I think it was more like trying to show the affect of computing flavor in the deep learning and deep reinforcement learning problems I was working on. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I didn't know about the glass thing that has been done, but I would, I would definitely <laughs> love to have those classes as a podcaster because that would really <laughs> save me many times. So I didn't <laughs> know, but, but yeah, overall, like, well, because how you said is it, it's more like you had fun around different, uh, exploring different projects, but at the end you did something much more of a serious topic that can really scale and you can use it for um, much more varied application, I would say. So, yeah. Yeah, and so this comes back to a question of like, what kind of impact do you want to have with your work? Because actually, like my original affective computing work, we did a lot of work on better models to predict um, happiness and health and stress in people, given their like everyday data from their smartphone or their wrist-worn sensor and stuff like that. And there was actually like a startup interested in following up on our work and like deploying it. So in a sense, that's like closer to to being deployed and touching a real human. And so I think that, in a sense, is pretty meaningful. Now the stuff I'm doing, it's like little dots running around in a grid world. <laughs> like, when is this going to be useful, right? But yeah. maybe there's something about like trying to go upstream. Like if you, if you invent something that uh, a lot of other people end up using in various ways, then maybe that's... Not that I'm doing that, but, you know, <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is one thing that I, I really agree to that because few of my friends who are working in the uh, task of NLPs and they are trying to understand how to uh, understand the inference between how we talk, right? Like the, based on the text, what I'm trying to, uh, what, what does that actually mean? So like humans say a certain words in different contexts and the uh, the task over there, like they are not dealing with any kind of these, they, these data are generated by uh, randomly. They are using, they are not using maybe the scraped elements from outside. And we talk like they, 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 they lack this particular thing is like, we don't know if our research is having any kind of tangible impact. And when, on the other hand, when I'm dealing with these data sets, I'm getting MRI scans from doctors and when I show them results, I'm actually talking to radiologists and chairs yeah. of uh, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's associations. So it really feels when, when they say that, yeah, this is this is something that we didn't see before. And it, it feels good, even though I'm just a first year PhD student, I don't know how the rest of my four years are going to go. But it definitely feels good at the end of a uh, weekend that, hey, I at least impressed a doctor who didn't know, like after out of his 30 years of uh, practice, he saw something that I did in like maybe three months. So I don't know if he being modest or if he's really happy with his results so yeah uh, i do agree um uh, i think and, that's and very meaningful like good for you and i think that's so cool you know <laughs> you, you're actually doing something that could help people in the real world i mean that must be a good thing.